Hello. Oh, great, that works. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for coming down. Uh, so this is uh, a night celebrating one of my favourite record labels, Brownswood Recordings. Uh, to introduce myself, my name's Ali Gilani. Uh, I run a record label called First Word Records. Uh, thanks. Um, and, uh, yeah, we're going to have... Hello? Rival. Rival, yeah. <laughs> I've got some pretty testing questions later on, so um, watch yourself. Um, so uh, we're going to have a, a live performance from uh, one of Brownswood's uh, newest signings, Skinny Palermo, later on, later on uh, which is something to very much look forward to. And before that, we're going to have a talk with the man behind Brownswood, Giles Peterson. Yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit bright that one, isn't it? Yeah, I, I did a gig last night in Italy and uh, it was all good when I got there for sound check. And uh, when I went on stage, it was a big stage for bands, but you know, when they have just a DJ on a big stage, a horrible feeling. And, it, and the crowd were right down there. And I was trying to push the sound, the, the decks right to the edge so that you could get closer. But they had, as I started the set, they just, this, the light show was a joke and I had to deal with it, contend with it for an hour and a half. Well, that, that, um, just think about that when you look at DJ. They don't, <laughs> I don't want it, I just want darkness. Do you, do you feel, if you've got the lights on you, do you feel um, uh, like embarrassed about dancing to the music? And, or do you feel that you just don't care? It's no, I, I mean, I, I, I'm still kind of of the generation as a DJ of uh, when the DJ wasn't, was the gig that people didn't want kind of thing. So for me, being a DJ was more a way of socially being able to go to places and not have to talk to anyone, but be there. Right. It was kind of, so then when it became, the DJ became, it's even like doing mix albums and stuff. I, I used to do lots of compilation records before I did my first sort of one with my name in lights sort of thing. And I was really weirded out because, you know, my name was selling the record. Up until then, I was always just the guy compiling in little, you'd see my name at the back of the sleeve. And it was actually, because I was running a record label, Talking Loud, at, at the time, and I was being asked by other labels to do mix CDs. I'd never thought about doing it on my own label, if you see what I'm saying. Yeah, no, I see that. So, in a way, I'm sort of coming from the generation of DJs um, that were before it became what it became. So, performing still for me is a bit strange because, um, you know... Because I run, that's why I run a record label, in a way, because I quite enjoy being in the background and just being able to watch it and see the journey take place and just be there with hinting, you know, uh, encouragement, really. That thing you're saying about, um, you know, you want to be the DJ, so you're kind of in the corner and inconspicuous, even going back before, do, do you enjoy being in clubs when you're not DJing, or is that weird? It's a bit weird now, because I'm getting at an age. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, even back, I guess now people will be coming up and saying hello and all of that. Yeah. But you know, way back when when you started, were you we into it or not really? Totally, yeah. I mean, yeah. I was a proper clubber, so I was like, my thing was going to, you know, at fifteen I was going to Pristat and Soul Weekender and sort of, you know, sorry, Case to Soul Weekender and Norfolk and and you know, going to wine bars where you know people like Barry Sharp and. People that were around before Cole Cox were DJing and playing jazz funk records and stuff. In fact, yesterday I was at, when I was at the uh, um, city airport on my way out to Italy. Um, this guy, I walked past this bloke, and uh, and he and he looked like a sort of football kind of fan. And uh, as I walked past, I looked at him though because he was wearing those kind of white Reebok shoes and stuff. And I was thinking that, that's old school kind of look. And I, walked, I walked past, and then I suddenly heard someone go, Giles. And he didn't really, and I turned around and it was him, and, and uh, he looked at me and goes, remember me? And I was like, oh, really no idea. And uh, he said, I used to sell your, your, your records um, in my uh, market shop in Sound Market, you know, when you were f at school. And, uh, and he was actually on tour because he's, uh, he's like one of the top Chelsea fans now, so he travels around <laughs> Chelsea everywhere. So that's why I had the, the football thing. But um, that was really weird because it kind of reminded me of the time when, you know, um, I used to kind of after school go to the record shop in, in Sutton Market and, um, and buy my Japanese imports and my jazz funk white labels and stuff. And, uh, you know, and then I'd hide them. I'd go home um, in Sutton. Um, and uh, my mum would like not like the fact that I was spending all this money on records, so I used to have to hide my records behind a tree near the house, get, to, get go and go inside with nothing, and then as she went to the kitchen, I'd run out and, and 
create the records and slowly my record collection would build up gradually. That's it's a very different experience for people discovering music now, right, I guess? I don't know, is it? I mean, of course they can get from A to Z much quicker than we could. I mean, I think the one thing that was interesting for me when I was like 14, 15, discovering pirate radio and discovering these little places where they were playing this amazing music that I couldn't hear anywhere else apart from a couple of, well, apart from pirate radio and Robbie Vincent on Radio London. And um, at that time, you know, it was kind of an amazing, mysterious world of amazing stuff. And I'd go and find where this was. I'd buy Black Echoes and I'd buy Blues and Soul and I'd go to the market in Sutton to buy my records. Um, and, um, and slowly I went from Grover Washington. I mean, you know, these days you can go from, you know, Yusef Kamal to John Coltrane in the space of one session at home, you know, on, on you know, YouTube or whatever. Whereas in those days it took me maybe five years to get from level 42 to Herbie Hancock, you know, or something, you know. So nowadays you can obviously get to the point much quicker. But I appreciated the fact that, you know, it, it was a, a slow journey, I suppose. I mean, there's just so much music out there. and uh, But, you know, these days you go out and... Uh, DJ, I was just talking to Stephen Budgess now, who is a manager and does a lot of stuff with Africa Express, and he came to see me at WOMAD. I played at WOMAD on Sunday night. I did the closing set, and he was telling me that most of the crowd was like, you know, between sort of 16 and 25. And they were, and I was like, did they get, were they into the music? Should I have played a bit more heavy sort of bass line? He says, no, no, they were completely, completely into it. And, and funnily enough, you know, as a DJ now, it's so good because people's understanding of this massive sort of, you know, amount of music is really, is deep, you know, so people, you can play stuff and people get it. Whereas before it was much more conservative, you know, you had to follow the DJs and listen to the songs a lot. So things have changed for good and, you know, for mainly good, I think. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, you, you can tell, I think anyone who listens to your show or who spends five minutes in your company, can see you're as enthusiastic about finding new music now as you were right back when you started. How do you, what's your process for discovering new stuff? Uh, how, how do you, you're spending, you know, hours every week listening to stuff, just piling through demos and the promos you're sent in? I have moments, I just, I just, I'm still passionate, I still like it, I still need that fix, I still need to hear something, it's a bit of, I don't know what it is, it's just that it's, it's my, I just, I, I'm that guy, you know, he's just mad into it. <laughs> and, um, and, and I always want to kind of, uh, I mean, it's, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, at, I'm, at, I'm at the cutting edge of it. It's a bit like I was saying, it's, in a way it's like being a chef, isn't it? It's like, you know, you become, um, you just, you need to go to, to the market and make sure you've got the best stuff for your for your kitchen, right? And for me, you know, I do a radio show, which I love doing, and uh, I have a online radio platform, Worldwide FM as well, and, and, and you know, radio is my first love in a way, and the experiences that I've had from hearing, you know, people, whether it's John Peel or whether it was Pete Tong or whether it was Steve Devon on Radio and Victor or Tim Westwood on LWR, when I heard them play a tune, and it was just like, for the first, I'd hear it, I was like, oh my God, that's just amazing. And so I always wanted to do radio. And, uh, and for me, you know, fortunately living in London, um, which is the epicenter of it all, I think, still, forget Brexit, maybe it won't be in a, in a year's time, but from culturally for me, it's a place that, you know, is an amazing crossroads. There's an awful lot of, of competition here and, and one-upmanship within music and fashion, which is a good thing for, 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 for the music to move forwards. And so me being at that place, which is a, a spokesperson, communicator of that culture, is uh, is is a privilege, and so I love it. <laughs> so whether it's uh, you know a new little seven inch that I just found you know in in, in flashback, or whether it's sort of walking around here and seeing the new Kaja Bonet record, and it still excites me. I still get excited more than anything walking past the record shop. That's my buzz. Still, you know, I can't walk past. Some people are into clothes and antiques or wine or whatever. Me, it's just like. Give me a record shop and I'll be happy in there for a while. I think as well, like it's, you must find it from traveling the world. You go into a record shop and it's there's a familiarity 
no matter where you are, which is which is reassuring. I think you know, I personally find it yeah. that way too. Um, so obviously you're discovering a lot of music and you've got that desire to share it on the radio. What is it that separates something when you hear it new that makes you want to sign it to the label? Um, well, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, I, I kind of got out of the music industry game, record game for a little while. Um, so just to go back, I started off doing comps for labels like Street Sounds and Blue Note. Um, I then got asked by a company called Ace to go to LA, uh, to San Francisco. I was only 19 and they asked me to go and um, go through the Prestige catalogue. Uh, they just, this is, a, Ace is a, is a record company that sort of licenses old labels. They were the first one really in the UK, Ace and Charlie. And uh, they were basically British labels that would buy up like old catalogues and re-release them and re-release like Nina Simone tracks and put them on on, on adverts on telly, that kind of thing. It's re really important, you know, labels that did lots of compilations. And anyway, I'd done this record for Blue Note called, uh, uh, what was it called? Blue Bossa, my first album for Blue Note. And uh, and that did really well. And um, they just said, can you go and, um, can you go to, we just acquired this catalogue, Prestige, Fantasy, Riverside. I've never been to America in my life, actually. And uh, and they said they got this, uh, they got their archive in Berkeley, California. And they just put me on a plane. And funny enough, my mate worked in the control tower at Heathrow. And I told him I was going to New York, I was going to America, to San Francisco. And he goes, uh, okay, fine, I'll sort you out. I said, well, didn't really know what he meant. I got on the plane and I was sitting in a really nice seat. And uh, that was when I first had business class travel. It was very difficult after that <laughs> to go back. Just can't go back. By the way, but I obviously did go back. Um, it, was, it was quite a difficult way to, um, it was a very nice first trip over there. And I went out there and I spent all day sort of going through their stuff and learning about kind of catalogs and, and you know, just it was very good education for me to see stuff and to see this. And it was a brilliant catalog. You know, they had John Coltrane, they had all these amazing jazz fusion records and funk and soul pleasure and all this stuff. So I was doing that, getting more and more into the thing. And, and so I was doing all these comps. And then, I mean, this is a bit of a long story. Maybe it's too long. But then um, when I was working... We're, at, we're all here to hear this, so it's fine. When I, when I was... When I was working at, um, so I was doing comps for all these different people. The label I set up for, for, for Ace, by the way, was called BGP. And it was Baz and Giles Peterson. So he was another DJ at the time, otherwise known as Beat Coast Public. And we put out about 30 or 40 compilations, which um, you can still find from Focus on Fusion to... That's, that's what, how, when I got into DJing, I would buy all those compilations. Right. That's how I, my first DJ sets were off about 10 records. Yeah. All on BGP or, uh, you know, BBE at that time as well. That yeah. Kind of yeah, so that, that that was that was great, and uh, you know I was definitely getting quite a lot of uh, experience putting these records together, and then I started doing records for Morgan Khan, Street Sounds. He was like the first guy in the UK to have an independent record label, a bit like an early BBE really, and he used to put together these compilations. Um, that would be of electro music or of boogie or disco or, or jazz, and because the scene here, the the club scene. We have to remember this is the big difference between the UK and anywhere else in the world, particularly at that time, was that we had uh, a very strong club scene, which was based on American imported music and jazz, funk and soul, basically, and early disco. And then you had these pirate radio stations that would broadcast it, and you had these magazines that would talk about it, and, and this created a culture, which was the kind of culture that led to Acid House in 1988. Um, and um, so this is, you know, the, the culture that I was growing up on and I was actually DJing in a lot of these parties but I would be playing in the back room and at the, even at the weekenders and stuff and I was that young kid who basically played jazz and offbeat Latin records at the back and, um, and, uh, and that's basically how I got my name and so um, when Morgan Khan was putting out all these compilation records, heard about me, he was like, let's get this guy to do a jazz compilation because there's people dancing to jazz records. And so that's how I started doing the Jazz Juice series, which, um, which, I, which you know, they, I did nine, nine volumes of that. So I did loads of stuff, loads of compilations. And then Morgan Khan said to me one day, he says, do you want to set up a label? Uh, well, actually, I, I went to him and I said, I I'd like to put out a record label and start re releasing new music from the UK. And, uh, and I did that with Andros Giorgio, who was the cousin of George Michael. And, uh, and so it was kind of cool. He had contacts and, and, and stuff. And, um, 
and Morgan Khan funded the first three releases, and none of them did anything. Um, one of them was a hip hop record by Jude Booty called Broadway, and another one was by a British sort of style council type of band called Pressure Point. The third one was a version of the Mohawks Champ, and uh, but none of them did anything. Um, and then um, the fourth, we were going to make a fourth. Well, we were talking about like doing another one, but Morgan Khan said I'm going to pull the money. So I thought, okay, that was a nice little experience. That's the end of that. And Andrew said to me, he says, listen, Giles, um, my cousin. Um, is up for doing a record um, for us under a different name, George Michael. But it's going to cost us 10 grand each. <clears throat> and at the time, because I was so sort of jazz, funk and soul, and you know, George Michael was definitely not cool, um, I was like, to be honest with you, I'm out, I'm out, <laughs> I'm out of this pop, but you can carry on with hardback. And, and that record was a version of the Bee Gees Jive Talking, which was like number one all around the world. And he made a fortune out of that. And that was actually the first really big. <laughs> mistake that I made in the music industry, but you learn, right? And, and, and it kind of got me into the, you know, the excitement of, of producing and going in the studio. And that was really the catalyst to me setting up Acid Jazz Records, which was very independent and then Talking Loud. And then I took a break because um, I did 11 years running Talking Loud and, um, you know, it was an interesting time. Brilliant, brilliant. You know, we put out Ronnie Size and Four Hero and and uh, Incognito, and New Eureka Soul, and Cole Craig, loads of things I'm very proud of, lots of Mercury-nominated al albums. And, but then I, I wanted to focus on, on radio a bit more, so I, t I, I took a break for three or four years, did more DJing, got on Radio 1, and then um, I was working down the road at Cargo, I had a night at Cargo, um, which is the club in Shoreditch, and uh, doing a Thursday night down there. And uh, this guy came over to me with a, with a it was, must have been a, a cassette or a CD or something, and he gave it to me, he says, oh, this is a, uh, a singer, it's pretty good, you know. And, uh, and uh, yeah, and, and I, I, that night I put it in my car, and it was, um, it was a singer doing a version of Equinox by John Coltrane. And it blew my mind. I was like, fucking hell, this is really, really good. Properly good. Um, not like a sort of average demo. Um, I was, I was really pleased I put it on, you know, because sometimes you, you do spend a lot of time, I, you know, putting on not great music. Um, but, but anyway, it was, it was amazing, it blew my mind, and I was like, all right, I've got to put this out. So um, that's when the idea of Brownswood came along, and I spoke to Emily Moxon, who's here today, and uh, and uh, we and Simon Goff, who was the manager of Ronnie Size, and a bunch of people, and we decided we'd do a record label. So that's how Brownswood came about. Oh, it was going to. That was one of the things I wanted to touch on because when you started this 2006, so I guess you were sort of planning it the year before. I guess um, you know that was a time when the industry was struggling. You know, the piracy was rampant. Um, I think labels, particularly in the independent sector, hadn't worked out how to make digital music work for them in the way that we have now. So, d did you feel it was a risk? Were you, or were you just kind of? Excited and like, yeah, I, I've never thought of things as a plan. I didn't, I wasn't thinking, oh, this what a great way to, to do a business. It was just, I want to put this out, I love it, let's put it out. And as long as we don't lose too much money, it's all good, really. And it and, it, and, and that was really, I didn't sort of the point being that it was, it was kind of going back to basics with the record label and doing something that was more a labor of love. I think I'd been a little bit burnt out by working. Um, within that industry for many, many years. Um, you know, I, I think, as I said, 11, 12 years at Talking Loud, um, which was a record label, which we have to remember is back when I started Talking Loud on the back of Acid Jazz, um, we're talking 1989, 1990, and, you know, the major labels had no idea about this underground that was going on in the UK. There were no boutique record labels. So, when I was invited, because I was running Acid Jazz out of my bedroom in, in my flat in Rotherhive at the time, I used to DJ and, you know, five nights a week and all the money that was going in DJing was paying for, you know, Galliano records and Brand New Heavies records and, and what have you. And, and so, but it was no, at that time, it was just really punk sort of, we had no idea, no clue about, you know, making money, it was just what you did. And and then, but the scene was, there was something happening in London and there was certainly something, you know, you got to remember at that time it was soul to soul, it was big, that was bubbling, you know, it was, it was, it was a good energy here, you know, but there was no labels doing this sort of thing. There was four from, there was a few sort of dance labels like FFRR and four from Broadway, people like that, but no one was doing the kind of 
what talking what acid jazz was, which was kind of like a, a British club culture music, but with a sort of quite a sort of DIY aesthetic of how you how you went about it, and it was great. But I was losing, you know, spending all my money. So when I got invited by um, by Nick. Um, Nick Angel, who was working at Phonogram Records at the time, he called me up. He goes, Giles, you know, do you want to do this for a major? You know, I'd like you to come in and work in an A and R department. You know, I said, well, yeah, I'll do anything if I, you know, great, it's a job. And I was 23 or something, and I was like, this is, a, you know, I still didn't think I'd know what I was going to be doing, um, you know, in my life. Um, and you know, I was just bluffing it, really, DJing and just, you know. And so I had a job offer, and they gave me a car and a job, and I was like, brilliant, you know. And, 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 and so I just said to Eddie Pillar, who I set up Acid Jazz with, um, I said, look, you take the label, doesn't matter, it's all good, um, and I'll just go and do talking that, because this movement needs a catalyst. It needs, it needs to be international, and Acid Jazz is just local. So I need to go and step it up to the next, and, uh, the next level, and that's what I thought I was doing at Talking Loud. And um, and and so, the next thing I'm I'm going to Hammersmith where the building was, where the office was, and I was in A and R meetings with rock people, you know, people who did indie and stuff. And and I remember the A and R meeting was was the first one that they spoke about Wet Wet Wet, Metallica, and Elton John. And th and then it was like, this is this new guy, Giles Peace, and he's got a new label, and everyone's like, yeah, whatever. And and literally, <laughs> literally, it took two years to to kind of. I was like. I was shell shocked, you know. I was like, "What did I do? You know, this is terrible," and I've ruined my, you know, everything's gone. And and but then I, I there's no way back really, and I just had to get down. I and I signed all my mates, <laughs> so I signed Young Disciples, which was Marco. I signed uh, Galliano, who's still my MC when we go out. I signed Bluey from Incognito. Funnily enough, Bluey from Incognito, when I was, I had a pirate radio station for my garden shed when I was 17, and, the, and I, 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 I wrote letters to all my favourite bands at the time to see if they would come and do an interview with me. And uh, in South London, deep South London, <laughs> Surrey actually. And, um, and I called Level 42, Light of the World, High Tension, and Incognito. None of the, the, fan, the fan clubs, you know, you wrote the letter like you did. And then the only one who responded to me was Bluey from Incognito. <laughs> And, uh, and he said, yeah, I'll come to South London. He was in Tottenham, and he came, I had a little tin pot pirate station, like literally, you know, broadcast to the end of my road kind of thing. And, and, he, and, and he came all the way. My mum made tea, and, and, and he introduced me in my garden shed, a little setup, and he introduced me to Ieto and, and George Duke, all these amazing bands. And it was great. And he was like, really amazing person. Why the fuck are you coming to see this kid, you know? And he'd already put out a few records and stuff. And so a few years later, forward fast, when I started up, set up Talking Loud, the first band that, um, well, the first demo I got was actually an Incognito demo. And so I was like, mate, do you want to sign to my label? So that was really brilliant. And, and what's even best is that they went on to become the, the, the band that saved the label because even though we had really cool bands that we did really well in London and, and in a few parts of Europe, it was minimal numbers still, you know. Um, Whereas Incognito, they weren't doing that well in the UK, but they had hits in America. So they used to write really good songs. And so AOR, um, Easy Listening Jazz, whatever, smooth jazz stations, they would be playing the Incognito track. So when it came to the end of the year and the accountants were looking at talking loud, they were going, well, there's some really cool stuff with lots of really good reviews, but none of it's selling. But this band Incognito are bringing in the, the money. So that's what actually, in the end, um, kept the label going for many years. That's yeah, it's funny how these things come back around, isn't it? You know, yeah, he took a chance on you many years ago, and then on it goes. Um, obviously, we just watched the film just now, um, which is fantastic, um, and it covers a lot of the amazing new jazz music that's coming through at the moment. I'm sure you've spoken about the London jazz breakthrough uh, until you're maybe fed up of talking about that. But what I did want to ask about that is how does that compare to when acid jazz came through when you were around for that does, does it feel what's similar energy yeah definitely i mean it's the thing is as well i was saying to someone the other day when acid jazz came along which was in 1987 1988 basically you know i was doing all the clubs with paul oakenfold and daniel amplin and everybody was taking acid and ecstasy or whatever and i was like no no i'm not doing that i'm going to stay on the weed and the beer the back 
and so so basically but but I liked the vibe that they were on but I was a bit jealous that they were on some new thing so I was like fuck I've got to redo what we're doing so we called it I called it acid jazz and uh, and and um, and it was great and, and, and it gave us an identity the backroom sort of mentality identity and people say, well, what is acid jazz? And I was like, I don't quite know. You know, it's like our ensemble of Chicago records mixed with acid future tracks and sort of crazy clubs in, you know, with one light and whatever. And it was good. That's what we were doing. But there wasn't really a music that we could call acid jazz. Whereas now, 30 years later, 30 years later, finally, when you, the, the band for me that represents what I imagined acid jazz to be in 1988 is The Comet Is Coming. So if you're going to see The Comet Is Coming now, to me, that is, if you'd have said, what is acid jazz? I'd have said, Comet Is Coming. And, and I think this new generation of musicians and producers and this whole community is absolutely what it was all about, you know. So we were kind of, you know, it, it's finally come through. So to do the We Out Here album um, was, I think, the, one of the absolute highlights that we've had at Brownswood. And, and going back to Brownswood in a way, you know, it started off with, with Jose James and, and it has been a very interesting period of change in the music industry. Um, and uh, we've been able to release some awesome records that I'm really, really proud of. And particularly in the last couple of years, it's, it, we've, 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 we've hit a really beautiful time. Another group that I think would be very acid jazz would be the Yusef Kamal record in a way, because in a way it kind of is a record that incorporates club culture, broken beat, jazz, fusion, funk, some sort of London aesthetic, vibe, swagger. And for me, that was this thing that, you know, that I'm re so all these records have been, you know, really exciting. So you, you touched on a few of the things you've released on Brownswood. Is there like a theme running through what you're putting out? Or do you, you know, when you're kind of working out what to schedule, are you trying to make the last one make sense with the next one and looking at it as a whole? Or is it just like, I like that, let's do it? Yeah, it's more like, I like that, let's do it. I think that there's no, and again, I think my, the problem, the, the strength and the weakness of what I've done maybe over the years is that people have never quite known what is coming out of acid jazz or what's coming out of talking loud. So one minute we put out a, uh, I don't know, Galliano record, the next minute we put out a Nicolette record, you know, and people are like, well, I, I, I'm buying it, I want to, you know, it's like if you bought, if you bought two-tone records, you'd know you'd get a Scar type of band, you know, it'd be the Selector, or it'd be the Specials, or, do you know what I mean? It was, but with my labels, it's always been so diverse, but for me, it's just music that represents club culture and, and, and the music culture of the UK. And it's always been a bit of a sort of alternative to the, what needs to be said a bit is the fact that this underground, club underground, the music that was coming out of it was always very, um, had very little profile in the media and on the radio in this country. So we were always fighting against the melody maker. We were always fighting against the enemy. We were always fighting against those people who were like all about the Smiths, all about Oasis, all about that. And as much as I like some of that music, it was always a struggle to kind of, you know, to, 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 get, to get our music out there. And, and that's continued to be a bit of what I've been about, whether it was like championing people like Mount Kimby or, or James Blake or Joy Orbison, and all this music coming out of dance music and is, it's, it's, it's really what I'm using as an inspiration for what comes out of Brownswood. But on the other hand, you know, one of the first releases we put out was, was we, in fact, many people, including myself, still think it's our best record or one of our very best records is a piano solo record by a guy called Elan Mailer called Scheme for Thought and that was the first record and it was at least 10 years before Erased Tapes came along <laughs> and Mills Farm and all that stuff so you know the whole kind of piano minimalism that was as much a part of what Brownswood was as Ghost Poet was was about Brownswood or or you know or Jose James or, or Gang Colours or you know, the compilations that we did, because the other thing that I, we did, you know, the Browns with Bubblers compilations, because there was, there was a gap in the market where a lot of this music that was coming through the beginning of the SoundCloud type of world, people putting things up and DJs playing it, the early MP3s, they needed, I felt, it was, it was difficult for me as a DJ to kind of, uh, to, to curate it. So in a way, to, 
I needed to, it's almost like I was kind of creating compilations so that at the end of the year when I did my review shows, I had these compilations ready made of this great sort of outsider music, which I could then call upon. And so that's why the Browns were Bubbles things came along. And, and, and the Browns with Electric Records, which I did with Alex Patchwork, who now works at Ninja, they were, they were really important records to kind of document the sort of shift in dance music um, you know, from sort of drum and bass and UK garage to electronic and 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 all the, the early days of of dubstep and when dubstep started going a bit more techno and and all the sort of inc incredible little in between musics that came out of that that needed to be documented for me. So that's why Brownswood. So people like Joy Orbison, you know, those sort of artists would would, would end up on on compilations like that. You mentioned the Brownswood Bubblers compilation. One of the other things I wanted to ask you about is the Future Bubblers program, which is a, a music talent discovery and support program, I guess probably the best way to put it. Um, what was the impetus behind starting that? It was just um, um, something that uh, made total sense for us. And uh, I think it's uh, you get to a stage as well when you're in this game, this industry, whatever you want to call it, that you kind of, you know, you need to put in as much as you take out of it in a way. So whether that's doing stuff like the Steve Reed Foundation that I do, which is a sort of Musicians in Need charity, which I do with Floating Points and Theo Parrish and, and, and Forte and various other m and um, so That's one thing we do, and we've been mentoring a lot of musicians and, and, and putting money back into Musicians in Need. And on the other hand, this whole thing about Future Bubbles was to kind of work with the Arts Council and uh, the PRS Foundation and to be able to really start mentoring and bringing through new artists and giving them sort of some development, early stage development. And it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a, a cool thing to do. Little did I know how much we would, I would get out of that. It was an amazing, it continues to be an incredible, incredibly rewarding program and we're on our third year just finished of, of artists and musicians and you'll see a little bit later on I mean I didn't do it for this reason uh, I didn't sort of in a way I, I didn't think about doing future but we, you know it wasn't like let's do future bubbles so that we can start kind of bringing people to Browns with records <laughs> indirectly but in the end you know we've had there's been so much greatness that's come out of that um, you know that Skinny Palembe, who's going to be playing here a little bit later on, he's obviously been part of, uh, of the Future Bubblers. Um, you've been working with Yasmin Lacey, who's another incredible artist that came through Future Bubblers and who we're all very excited about as well. Indeed, yeah. H how are we doing for time out there, anyone that knows? <laughs> About 15, okay, all right. Oh, I, okay, yeah, I had um, a couple of things. I've made notes, very professional. Um, I just wanted to reel off a couple of artists that you've worked with over the years, and if you can tell me, if you remember, how and when you first came across them. So the first one is a big favourite of mine, Four Hero. Um, Four Hero, Four Hero, Digo, Mark. I, well, we put out Ronnie Size on Talking Loud. That was already quite radical in a way, because drum and bass was, was you know, it's a bit like... If you play drum and bass in a club when drum and bass was just kicking off or a year later after it started in your club, you know, people were like, I'm not into it. You know, it was a it was a it was a decision, you know. So I remember like well that's why I set up anyway, that's another thing. Different clubs. But anyway, the drum and bass experience was essential. It was the most powerful movement to come out of the UK, out of dance music, no question. And to me, it still is the music that resonates massively. Um, and it is so British. It's with so, so, so much to be proud of, of that, mo that movement. And, and weirdly enough, that movement's got a bit of a parallel with the jazz movement of right now, in the sense that that movement had brilliant leaders. And any movement needs great ambassadors or communicators to really take it to the next level, to inspire the next generation, and to communicate with people who want to know but they don't can't get in. So whether it was Bookham, whether it was Fabio, whether it was Goldie, whether it was Ronnie Sides, well, you had proper characters. And for me, I used to go at speed every week. You said, "Do I go clubbing?" I used to go <laughs> every Thursday. I'd be at speed, listening to Foot Fabio and, and Groove Rider. And and even though I was doing well as a DJ at the time and travelling and doing the you know the labels going on and everything, I was a drum and bass nut. 
And so when I had, and, and out of all the drum and bass, the music that killed it for me was the Bristol sound. Because I had a thing for Bristol anyway, and I was always a little bit pissed off that I never signed Porter's Head. <laughs> and, 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 you know, Massive Attack, I knew about Massive Attack, and, and they, they were obviously amazing, but I, they were never, you know, I was too young at the time. Porter's Head really annoyed me, because I was like, they, they, they invited me to their showcase, I was like, and I went to it, I was like, how come I didn't even know about this? I was so good, and but, but equally amazing music, right? So Bristol always, you know, Smith and Mighty, you know, the pop group. There's such a great history of music in Bristol, and um, and in fact, my first gig as a DJ outside of London was at the Thecla in Bristol, and so I had a sort of thing with that. So when I heard Ronnie Size and the music he was making with his mates, who were basically DJ Crass, DJ Sav, Dynamite, Honorly, that crew, amazing, like all stars. It was drum and bass, it was reggae, it was bass line, it was jazz, it was funk. He was, they were killing it, and I was like, we've got to sign this. So my friend Paul Mine, who I was running Talking Loud with, we both went on a mission to sign Ronnie Size, and then we signed Ronnie, Represent, DJ Crust, and then, at the same time as that, Goldie put out Inner City Life, which annoyed me as well, because I was like, this is too good, this track is too good. That really annoyed me. And it annoyed me particularly because my office was literally next door to FFRR. And so I could see Pete Tong's office from my office. Um, and the cars would park into the communal car park and they'd either go into the FFRR London offices or they'd come into the Mercury phonogram talking loud office. I remember Goldie going straight into Pete Tong and then a few months later I, I, I heard him a seat. But he actually came into my office and played me in a seat that pissed me off. Massively. Yeah. But, but I really loved it. And then, and then of course at the same time as that I was like, I want that sound because Ronnie was giving me the kind of more rough street thing. And, and, and then, you know, I, I knew um, For Hero from their releases on Reinforced. And, uh, and they, they put out a record called Universal Love which was just almost better than Inner City Life. And, and so, because it was jazzy in a good way and, and had those kind of Detroit sounds. So we just approached Mark and Digo and, and that was hard because Digo is, you know, he doesn't fall, suffers easily. You know, he doesn't, what's the word? He doesn't, suffers gladly, yeah. Um, and so that took a bit of work. But luckily for me, because I was on Pyro Radio and Mark was into my music, um, we managed to convince them to put out a couple of their records. So, you know, but they were very controlled. I mean, they were like much more, we give you the record, we decide who the remixes are, you know, you just put it out. Don't even try an A&R's, <laughs> which was great. And in a way, that's the future. For me, that's always been an important thing. I think A&R'ing, which is quite a big, topic of conversation, I suppose. a ring is an interesting one because you can mess up a band probably more so by a and r them than if you believe in them from the beginning and just let them flourish. So, you know, I've, I've, I've had some a &R disasters, but I've also found that some of the, the best bands a and r themselves anyway, basically. They just need a bit of guidance. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that completely. I think, yeah, sometimes I... Um, I think if you're a and someone that much, do you really like them that much? Do you know what I mean? Like, if, you, if, you, if you're signing them, you like it, just do it. Let them... It's that line between you being able to have an objective view on the music as a fan, and but then not, if you want to be an artist, just do it yourself almost. Do you know what I mean? There's that line. But then equally, you know, you can advise. And this is, like, I think what I've got now is I've got, if nothing else, I've got 35 years of experience. <laughs> So there's something there, which if the artists want to talk to me about it, then I, you know, I'm here, but yeah. Um, I'm going to do one more of these and then we'll open it up for some questions from the floor. Um, Ghost Poet. Great. Yeah, amazing. Again, that was a demo that came through uh, um, someone who worked for us called Peggy Jean Louis, who was brilliant. Um, again, another thing I think which is really important for record labels to flourish. Um, is you need to make sure anything to flourish really is just make sure you are I need to be inspired by people that's really to be honest with you the reason I do anything that I do is just to I just need people to be going Giles have you heard this you know I just need enthusiasm and, and buzz so you just need to have people around you that are really passionate and into the music and you need to make sure you keep sort of the door open don't close it don't ever think you know too much I think it's always about you know you never know anything it's about really just 
open door and through this exchange stuff comes through so ghost player was exactly that you know peggy came in she she heard this guy um i i was like this is killer um you know it's just a bit roots maneuver but it's a bit more indie i love what he's saying i like his samples i like his vibe I started playing it on the radio um and i was like is this you know and, then, and it was just natural i played it on the radio and then i said i'd love to release this and it just happened naturally and it was a really great record um which which was nominated actually got a mercury um, and um, and it's good to see that he's gone on to do really well. I mean, people ask me as well, why don't you, um, you know, sometimes the artists don't stick with us or, you know, or they move on. For, for me, you know, I think if we're an independent record label and, uh, you know, and, 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 and we've grown and we're, we're, we're not the small label that we were. And I think that we can do a great job for artists for, for a while, but I also think that we're kind of part of a of, of a process for a group. I mean, when a group, an artist like Jose James comes along, and you know, we're an independent label in the UK. You should be on a major international jazz label. You should be touring. So someone like him going to Blue Note makes sense, you know. And I think Ghost Poet, it was like the right time, you know. But we we we, we made a wonderful record, and uh, we remain tight. And um, we, yeah, really happy with that one. That first one's a great record. Yeah. Um, okay, I think we've got time for a couple of questions from the crowd. So if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand nice and high. And uh, someone's got a microphone somewhere. Got one just, just there by this pillar. Yeah, lady just there. Hi. <laughs> So, uh, well, I want to ask something quickly. Uh, so, why do you think now is like this jazz subculture, uh, Aces Jazz, this community is resonating, vibrating now, right now, in this year, in this period, you know? So, is, do you think like his music is now, like during the 70s, politically also, you know, important, you know? People can hear but listen also to music while they are dancing. Do you think so? It definitely, yeah. No, it's 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 great at the moment, and I think that um that's only going to get it's it's only going to get better in a way. I think that what's happened here in the UK particularly is that um, we've taken a. We've taken a kind of I, I I look at the UK scene a bit like what happened in America with um, hip hop. And uh, you know, I, I I look at Odd Future as an example of, of, of a movement oh, yeah. of a movement that came up that we didn't know about. You know, it just it came up on its own and it created its own community and it learned to to you know do everything and uh, and that m motivates everyone. So in a way, I think the British scene it happened without people around it sort of telling it what to do. They 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 they, they, they worked it all out. There is a political sort of under sense, which there was back in, you know, around punk and around new wave and around acid jazz. And, and I think that that's very much part of it. But I think the other thing is that people are into, you know, listening to people who've, who've got a craft, you know, like you can't, you see new bio, you know, on stage with Femi, Joe Armand Jones, um, you know, Theon Cross, Shabaka, you see these people, they are world class. And, and they're playing and they're playing and they're doing so many gigs. And that was a problem that we had for a little while in this country. There weren't enough venues for these people to be playing all the time, but they've created their community. They've created their venues. Unfortunately, in London, North London, we just lost Total Refreshment Center, which is a real shame because that was a really big you know, place for people to go and share, for the community to grow. Because any scene has to have a, the places, but it, there'll be something new will come along. But I think that at the end of the day, we've got all of those things here. People and people, you know, people, people are bored of lowest common denominator muck. You know, back in the day, this is the great thing about now. People have got great, better taste than they've ever had. And so as a result, the music's coming out of that. Um, yeah. cool. <laughs> Just another thing, if you want, if you have time. This is the, like the question of the century. I mean, when this modern age in which internet is necessary, you need to uh, a smartphone to listen to music, but I mean like Spotify, all these, you know, social media, do you think that they can create like internet, can be a community, consider a community, or it's like too much fragmented, you know, we are separated, isolated, or we can be 
one like community? Well, I think it's the, the internet is a great place to, to, to discover and to learn and to, to, to educate yourself if we're talking about music and culture. So in that way, it's great advantage. But what's, the reason the scene is growing is because people are getting out of their bedrooms and they're going to places and they're, and they're performing and there is a real human community. And that's a reaction to, you know, this in your bedroom community. So as a result, I think, you know, this is a magical time and hopefully it's gonna grow and we're gonna get incredible musicians coming out of it. And, and and it will grow all over the world, you know. I mean, already there's places around the the UK, around the world that are beginning to, you know, Chicago's got a really good scene at the moment. We're, we're actually going to make a record at Brownswood, a kind of We Out Here follow-up in Melbourne in November. So there's such a great scene in Australia at the moment. It felt like a really good place to, to try and do the same thing. A very active live music scene, great community. And so, you know, um, yeah, I'm very positive. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Have we got any more? Come on, don't be shy. Got one just there. Um, how did you get into all the um, Brazilian stuff? Well, Bluey played me George, uh, actually played me I'm Fine How You by the percussionist Aieto that day that he came to see me in my little my, in my garden shed or at the radio station. That was an intro to me. And George Duke, Brazilian Love Affair. It's a really good record. I think they got it in here. And I like George Duke because he made disco records. And uh, he made a record called Brazilian Love Affair, which actually I saw, they, they, it was one of those very rare records that they would play on the radio here. It was one of those obscure things that became a hit, disco hit. And I bought the album and that album actually wasn't disco, it was a Brazilian record. So. I bought it for one thing, but then when I bought the records, I suddenly discovered Milton Nascimento and Ayeta Flo and all those people, some great Brazilians. And that was my doorway in. And in a way, I've always remembered that. And, and I think it's important. I did a record in Brazil a few years ago called Sonzera and um, Bam, Brazil Bam Bam Bam. And again, it, I wanted to do a bit like the George Duke thing, just get an all-star cast, do versions of songs that people might go into, we did a version of a song by Freeze called Southern Freeze on there and maybe people bought the record because of that and then they discovered all this other Brazilian music. So I've always been into sort of bringing people in and then going deeper with them. Uh, but Brazilian music's, yeah, very, um, it's interesting, you know. It's interesting that as DJs we were playing, you know, we were, I was playing in pubs and wine bars, you know, when I was 17, 18 and we were playing sambas and people were dancing to them. It's like, it's so obscure. You know, Brazil's, Brazilians would come or people would go, what the fuck, what's going on? You know, it was, it was so weird. That's what's so brilliant about this country. You know, this is the country that did Northern Soul, you know, really weird independent soul records from little city, little towns in America it suddenly became huge in, in, in Northern England. And I think that's, again, one of the reasons that I like it here, because there's always some little subculture that will pop along and something will come out of it. One more, cool. one more and then we'll, we'll have to move things on, I think. Hi, how you doing? Thanks for the film, brilliant. Second time seeing it. I um, was really interested to see Gary Crosby in the film because that was really important to me because he's bridging the previous generation to the present generation. It's really inspirational. And I know you've got talent for taking um, you know, artists that are probably in obscure, probably like, I'm thinking of Terry Callier, who basically you work with and he was not someone that our generation was really, really you know, au fait with, but because of your work, you kind of brought him back to a new generation. Is there anyone at the moment that you'd like to work with of that ilk, should yeah, I say? Yeah, yeah. I mean, first of all, I think it's interesting, and I'm really pleased that Gary was in this documentary, thank you, and, um, you know, that, and, and you know, yeah, this isn't just something that's popped up overnight, right? I mean, the thing is, there was many, many generations of musicians going back to the 50s with people like Joe Harrier and Tubby Hayes in the UK, and uh, all the way through the 70s with the fusion artists like Ian Carr and Don Rendell, um, Nucleus, all these groups, all the way through to Courtney Pine and Steve Williamson and, and Gary Crosby. And, and, and another artist that I'm really proud of working with is Zara McFarlane, who's just done the third album that I'm delighted with, produced by Moses Boyd, who's 23, 24 years old. And that was a beautiful connection of generations to a degree. So anyway, yeah, those people this scene, it keeps going, it's not something that's just appeared. And I think it's really important that the Cleveland Watkisses and the Julian Josephs and all these peop 
people, you know, Philip Ben, all these people get their due re respect as well because they were very important, you know, for this, for this new generation. I think the younger generation are giving them props and, and, and remembering that. From my point of view, yeah, half of my job is about new music. The other half of it is about remembering the legacy artists. And I think that one of the biggest pleasures that I have, what I do, is actually, you know, being able, I'm in a beautiful position where I can interview and meet these great people, you know, whether it's Bobby Womack or Chaka Khan or Roy Ayers or Ayeto or, so I love it, you know, it's so great, so much to learn. Those lot, they work so much harder, you know, you can't, as a DJ, you, it's, we're so spoiled, you know, they were doing two gigs a night, you know, every night, for years, earning fuck all. You know, really hardcore. So, in a way, for me, it's about sort of, you know, if I can at least put a light on these people in a good way. I'm working on an album with Roy Ayers at the moment. That's my that's my new thing at the moment. So he's one of the artists that I think, like a Gil Scott Heron or like a Bobby Womack, those sort of artists that were sort of huge influences, but actually weren't maybe as big as they should have been in the grand scheme of things. And Royers is absolutely that person. For me, he's the one who links everything from, you know, the jazz in the 60s and then Los Angeles and that kind of West Coast sound through to his proto-disco stuff, his funk, his cosmic jazz, his fusion, his African stuff with Fela Kuti. You know, he did it all and he's still around. Um, and I want everyone to know who he is. You know, there would be no Pharrell without a Roy Ayers, right? There would be, I mean, you know, Kendrick samples him. Every, you know, he is like the Holy Grail in a way. So for me, to do a record with him will be a, a, a nice, a nice journey. You know, I lost my virginity to Roy Ayers. <laughs> not, not literally two words. <laughs> on, on that bombshell. Um, <laughs> Okay, thank you for your questions and, uh, and thank you very much, Giles Peterson. Okay, we're going to have a, a short break and then Skinny Palendo will be up playing live, go and get a drink and uh, yeah, stick around. <laughs>